finish up our series that I entitled Daniel's Stories from Babylon. If you've been with us, we have gone almost chapter by chapter through the book of Daniel, and we're done with it. We've completed the book of Daniel, but I've added an epilogue, just a final chapter apart from the book of Daniel to talk about what I've entitled Babylon Rising. Babylon Rising. If you have your Bibles or, or your device, I wish you would turn, please, to Isaiah 13, verse 19. And while you're turning there, a real quick recap about what we know about Babylon. If you went to Sunday school as a little kid and you remember the story of the Tower of Babel, King Nimrod, when everyone spoke one language and when they were all in one giant civilization, King Nimrod decided to build a tower, what we call the Tower of Babel, that would reach up into the heavens. God was displeased with Nimrod and, and caused confusion, Babel. And uh, he caused everyone to start speaking different languages and people of different languages and all that chaos and confusion. They found each other and then separated into their own families, their clans, their languages. You might remember from history, maybe from school, one of the seven ancient wonders of the world were the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Historians of the time saw those and were amazed at that beautiful, sprawling city. Historians say maybe the first city to reach 200,000. You might also know that there was a goddess in that pagan culture, a goddess called Ishtar. And Ishtar was the goddess of sexuality, sensuality, the god of love. She was also the god of war, the god of violence. And um, we see all that playing out in the book of Daniel. Violence, slavery, war, defilement. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were taken into a very pagan culture, very sensual culture. And one of the first things Daniel decided, I will not defile myself. Babylon today is in ruins. You can go to Baghdad, drive 60 miles south, and you can see the ruins of Babylon. They still exist. Isaiah would prophesy that Babylon would be destroyed because of her sensuality, her violence, her sin, never to rise again. That Babylon would only always be a haunt for jackals, and the owls. And if you're in the desert, 60 miles south of Baghdad today, you can hear the howl of jackals, the hoot of owls, as you look out over the remnants of ancient Babylon. Listen to this prophecy, Isaiah 13, 19. Babylon, the jewel of kingdoms, the pride and glory of the Babylonians, will be overthrown by God like Sodom and Gomorrah. Wait, what? Babylon was so wicked, it was destroyed as in previous centuries Sodom and Gomorrah had been. Because of sensuality and wickedness, she will never be inhabited or lived in through all generations. Babylon is synonymous with confusion overindulgence, idolatry, and the worship of sexuality. In that spirit of Babylon, that demonic spirit of Ishtar has tracked through our cultures. Ishtar, Jezebel, those spirits are prevalent today as Babylon rises again. In the Bible, the book of Revelation, John, its author, predicted that the last great city of the empires of men, the last great city 
that would rule over the kings of the earth, that would be at war with believers in the last days, would be called Babylon, the mother of harlots. And as hard as it is to conceive of what I'm about to tell you, I believe the Bible is true. And what John wrote in Revelation, as he saw down through the centuries this prophecy unfolding about the great whore Babylon, there was no mistaking what city he was talking about. You see, ancient Babylon still lies in ruins. It will never be resurrected. It will never be a world power. But in figure, symbolically representing ancient Babylon is a real city. You know its name. Its name is Rome. Rome, which today is not a political world power. It is not the center of the universe. It is not the center of commerce. Rome will one day become a world power it will rule over the kings of the earth and it will be destroyed because of its overindulgence, its sensuality, its adulteries. It will be destroyed by God as ancient Babylon was in one hour. Now you might um, have a hard time believing that Rome, Rome could be that city, but we don't know what is going to happen between now and then. What Prophetic things could, be hap could happen in our world that would cause Rome to rise to power. As hard as it is to conceive of that, you may have an even harder time believing this. Did you know that John in the book of Revelation, chapter 11, verse 8, says Jerusalem will descend into chaos, brutality, sensuality, and it will be nicknamed Sodom. Wait, what? Jerusalem, the home of the Jewish people? Sodom? But as the world gets turned upside down in future days, and as we're seeing that, that tilting begin to take place now, we don't know how things are going to align. The Bible prophecy teacher said it's possible. It's just possible that the United States isn't here in future days. There's no reference of it. There's no hint of it in Bible prophecies. And at least one Bible teacher has predicted that maybe we're not here. Maybe, maybe we're destroyed. Maybe the future America is destroyed in an atomic blast or is so wasted and become, and become vacant that it's, it's, it's on the back burner. It's a non-player in world events. Rome will be. It will rule the earth. Now as John wrote Revelation, Rome ruled the earth at, at that writing. John was in exile on the Isle of Patmos when he wrote Revelation. It was because of Rome. Rome was brutalizing Christians. Christians were being thrown into the, to the lions in the Colosseum. They were, their blood was being spilled there. They were being hunted down and martyred all over the world. It's this first century church that John is writing, but it's also this prophecy that he's seeing. Turn to Revelation 17. In Revelation 17, we, we, see, a, we see very clearly this Babylon rising. In fact, uh, a couple of chapters are devoted to this last great world power, this last great city that will rule over the kings of the earth. Beginning in verse 1, one of the seven angels who had, who had the seven bowls came and said, come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits by many waters. Can I stop right there? John said, the angel said, come, I want to show you who I'm talking about. And you will recognize her when I show you. Can I stop right there and let's go backward. Do you remember when we were studying in the early chapters of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar, 
first king of Babylon had a dream. It troubled him. He called Daniel to interpret it. He said, Daniel had a dream of a giant statue, a head of gold, shoulders and, and chest of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, and feet iron mingled with clay. In my dream I saw a great rock cut out of a mountain and came and hit the statue in its feet and it fell to the ground. Daniel gave this interpretation. Your vision in your dream, Nebuchadnezzar, was a vision of the empires that will rule the earth. By the way, they will, Daniel said, they will rule the earth till future days. And so Nebuchadnezzar, the head of gold is you, the great Babylonian empire. It will be displaced by the Medo-Persian empire, King Darius, who cast Daniel into the lion's den. After some time, the great empire of the Medo-Persians will be replaced by Greece, the, the uh, belly and thighs of bronze or brass. Greek will give way in future days to legs of iron, the Roman Empire, this harsh, brutal empire that would rule over the world. But then in future days, Daniel said, the statue that had feet of iron mingled with clay, Daniel said there will be a confederation of kings, but Rome will be in the mix. And it will not be a strong confederation and it will fall when Christ, the great rock, will strike the empires of the world at its base. God will strike those federations and Rome when he returns. Daniel said the statue that you saw fell and broke to pieces, turned into dust, and the empires of, men, of mankind finally replaced by the kingdom of the great King Almighty, Jesus. The angel said to John, let me show you who I'm talking about. With her, the kings of the earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet, was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand, filled with abominable things in the filthiness of her adulteries. And this name was written on her forehead, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. The mother of the abominations of the earth. And I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. Revelation 17, 18. This woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. Now as John was writing that, it was at that moment the great city the home of Caesar, and it ruled over the kingdoms of the earth. But John prophetically saw that it would rise again, this harlot Babylon, and the Roman Empire would have one, less, one last stand in the last closing days of earth history. I want to show you a picture of a coin this is a coin from the days of John. This, this would have been a very um, available, a very recognizable coin in John's day, in that first century. A Roman coin, a Roman coin, Roma, and Roma is referring to the woman on the coin. Now, I didn't read this, but elsewhere in chapter 17, John says, and I saw this woman, she was sitting on seven hills. Rome is built on seven hills. And when he wrote those words, when first century Christians read those words, they pulled out their change and they looked at it, there it is. 
Roma sitting on seven hills. It's not, we're not quite sure what uh, is in her hand. It might be a scepter. It might be a, a goblet. We're not sure. But it's um, obviously a woman, obviously dressed regally, reclining on the seven hills of Rome. That is the great harlot that John saw in prophecy. That would be the last city to rule over mankind. Did you know that if you spell Roma backwards, it spells Amor? Amor was a Roman goddess. Think Ishtar. Amor was a Roman goddess of violence, war, and sexuality. The woman on this coin represents the goddess Amor, who uh, is the goddess of pleasure. In ancient Rome, they worshipped her. They worshipped sexuality. Rome was a filthy, wicked place, awash in, in paganism and sexuality. And it was diminished. It has been diminished through the centuries. It will rise again. And it will rise with such power that it is able to intoxicate the nations of the earth with sensuality, and it will rule over the kings of men. That day is coming in the future. I was reminded this week in my study that Rome is called the city of love. It is the, head, it is the headquarters of the Vatican, the Roman Catholic Church. It is almost beyond comprehension that one day it could be likened to Sodom and Gomorrah. So I was, I was doing just some casual study and reading. I came across a woman's blog who had traveled there. I want to just read this for you. Rome is synonymous with romance, she writes. It's all in the name. As one local explained to me, if, if you reverse the word Roma, the Italian word for Rome, you get amor, meaning love. Amorous, amor. And love is something that resonates throughout the entire city, especially evident at night time. The romantic undertones permeate the place as tangibly as pizza or pasta, as intertwined as food and love may be. Rome is a place where an individual can satisfy their passions. The spirit of Ishtar is in Rome today. The spirit of Amor is alive in Rome today. And those evil, wicked, adulterous spirits are alive in our world today. This backdrop that Tyler put up here represents ancient Babylon and its effect through the centuries, through different cultures. And it's, in power, it's, it, it's impacting our country today. You don't have to look very far before you realize that adultery is the theme of our culture. Yeah. Adultery defined, I don't have to stay with one lover. I can give myself heart, mind, body sexually to one lover and then I can have another one. I don't have to be bound anymore by those old antiquated laws and traditions about marriage. If I get bored, if I get tired, I can move on. If I get seduced, it's all right. It's just adultery. The spirit of Ishtar, the spirit of Amor permeates our culture. You turn on the television and there she is. She's one keystroke away on your computers or your phones. The spirit of adultery. It 
is in our factories, in our businesses, in our colleges, in our middle schools. The spirit of adultery permeating Christian homes. The spirit of adultery having its way among believers. Adultery, again defined this way, I made a pledge to one, but I willfully ignore that pledge for another. I've been doing this a long time. In the spirit of sexual license, The running sewer of pornography and Christians' willingness to not keep their pledge. The church, believers, are being infected by that intoxicating cup of adultery. Would you turn to the book of James, please? I'm sorry. Let me, I'm sorry. Let me go to Revelation 17, verse 2. Revelation 17, 2. With her... The kings of the earth committed adultery. The inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Paul would write, in the last days, speaking prophetically, in the last days, men will become lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Paul writing in Romans chapter 1, again, prophetically, seeing what was happening, says, the wrath of God is being stored up and it is going to be poured out on men in the last days. Romans 1, beginning in verse 24. Because of their rebellion, Paul says, God gave them over in their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity. In other words, if that's what your hearts are bent to, have at it, and he gave them over for the uh, degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And they worshiped and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. We live in a world, your children are growing up in a world that has absented God from their thinking. And what they worship and all they know to worship is sensuality, pleasure. And what is the next high that I can get? Paul said there is coming a day when the world will be delivered to their own drunkenness. If you're intent on drinking from that cup, drink it. And the whole world will be intoxicated not with alcohol, but with sensuality, sexuality, adultery. I say, as a people, as a nation, we are right there. And what is the Christian response? Now, please, James chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. James, the bishop at Jerusalem writing to the church. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but don't have, so you kill. You covet but you can't get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you don't ask God. When you do ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. 
he concludes with this, you adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Enmity meaning hostility. Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. James writing to the church, speaking to the church today, might say to us, you adulterous people, you can't have it both ways. You can't pledge yourself to God who rescued you by sending his son to die for you, who sanctified you by his blood on the cross and has promised you resurrection and home. You can't pledge yourself to him and then willfully defer to someone else. Back to the world and its pleasures. And if you do, we become an enemy of God. Judgment is coming to a wicked culture who will drink that intoxicating cup of the great whores' adulteries. Revelation 18, 4 through 8. I'll quickly end right here. Would you turn there, Revelation 18, 4 through 8. Still writing about Babylon. John writes, Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out. Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues, for her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as she has given. Pay her back double for what, he has done, what she has done. Pour her a double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torment as grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasts. This city, Rome, in future days will boast. I sit enthroned as a queen. I am not a widow. I will never mourn. Therefore, in one day her plagues will overtake her. Death, mourning, and famine. She will be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord God who judges her. Come out. Come out now from Babylon. Come away from Ishtar, from Amor, from Jezebel. Purify yourselves, pledge yourself to the lover of your souls and keep that pledge. Keep the pledge of righteousness, holiness in your lives. Come out, 2 Corinthians 6, 16 through 18. I want to give you a second to get there. 2 Corinthians Speaking of this double-mindedness among believers, the spirit of adultery with the world, Paul writes, tell me what agreement, what, what arrangement is there possible between the temple of God and pagan idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore come out. Come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing. And I will receive you. I will be a father to you. You will be my children, my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. May I finally remind us of where we've been in these stories from Babylon. Daniel's first, jet, first day as a slave in exile in Babylon, put into the king's service, unclean food was set before him. And he said, I will not defile myself. Kill me if you want to. I'm not eating that. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were at the threat of being thrown into a blazing furnace, bowed down and worshiped this idol. Shadrach said, we're not going to have this conversation, king. There's nothing to talk about. We are not bowing down. We have a God who can save us, but if he doesn't, 
we're still not bowing down. Daniel, an older man now, refusing to pray to anyone, especially a human, anyone other than Jehovah, was threatened to be thrown alive into a den of lions. And he would not give in, he would not give up, he would not bow down. And our challenge throughout this series is a dare to be a Daniel. To not give in. To the Babylonian sensual, filthy culture we live in. Daniel 1.8 But Daniel resolved not to defile himself.